Hello, welcome to the July 1st, 2020 meeting of the Gaithersburg Planning Commission still on our virtual platform. How's everybody doing tonight? Everybody well? Good. All well. right. Um, first up would have been the, uh, let me make two announcements. One is um, if you tuned in to or you logged into the site last week to look at the agenda, there was an additional item um, concerning some public testimony on the um, proposed Wawa site. Um, that's been pulled from that agenda with the agreement of the applicant and all those involved. Um, and I think scheduled, Greg, what, to the first meeting in, in August? Yeah, August 5th is the uh, new schedule for that. Okay, so that'll, that'll, that'll come back um, at our next or, or in a couple agendas. Um, and we don't have minutes to approve tonight, so that takes us to our site plan agenda. And Brian, if you'll begin to bring the, the applicant team in for afp a Five one five dash twenty twenty. The final architecture for the single-family detached units in Crown Neighborhood Three in the MXD zone. This is an amendment to final site plan. And uh, presenting from staff is Jasmine Forbes. Good evening, Jasmine. You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. Can I have the um, the presentation up, please? Okay. Uh, so staff's before you to present amendment to final site plan application mm -hmm. AFP-8515-2020 uh, uh, the applicants requesting approval of the final architecture of the single family detached units in crown neighborhood three can i please have the next page please as shown on the screen uh, the proposed 21 units will be sited along crown park avenue and i believe this is either the last uh, architecture that be approved for neighborhood uh, three. Uh, this application is based upon previously approved final site plans SP-7474-2017 and site plan um, SP-7688-2017. This application comes before the Planning Commission in accordance with section 24-172A, which requires the Planning Commission to grant amendments to approval, um, site, uh, sorry, to grant amendments to approve final site plans. Uh, the applicant's also requesting a modification uh, to the Crown Neighborhood 3 and 5 uh, guidelines to allow window wells, cantilever fireplace uh, places, and cover stoops to encroach beyond the built two lines. Uh, the commission has the authority to approve or deny modification requests as outlined within the Crown um, Neighborhood 3 and 5 design mm -hmm. guidelines. And I will have Harris Swab from uh, Harris, Michael Harris Homes to start the presentation. And can I please have the next uh, slide, please? Okay, let me jump in right now. It looks like Matt, you've joined us, right? So everyone's here. If you don't see him already on the, the side panel, he is there. Yeah, apologies to all. I had an uh, allergy fit. <laughs> I couldn't quite come on. So if I mute myself and I'll sneeze separately. Fair enough. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Harris Schwab. I am the owner of Michael Harris Homes. I'm here tonight with two colleagues that are also um, virtually connected, uh, Ben Bullock and Jenny Spicer, who will be available to assist in, in case I need some assistance. Um, uh, Michael Harris Homes has been a, a, a developer in the uh, Montgomery County market for a long time. We, we were established in 1984. Uh, we did projects in the county such as Symphony Park next to Strathmore, um, <clears throat> Chestnut Lodge in uh, Rockville, um, Grosvenor Heights with EYA, um, and we built in Kentlands and Lakelands. And most recently, we partnered with Westbrook Partners to do the Copley in Crown Neighborhood 1, the 128 condos that are right behind the... Uh, right in the middle of uh, neighborhood one. Um, next slide, please. So let me just jump to the site plan real quickly. Next slide, please. This is the overall plan and, and the bottom right corner shows where the 21 lots are, which are right near the retreat and that stick of townhouses in the bottom right hand corner. Next slide. This illustrates the site. We, we're proposing uh, two houses tonight with three elevations. This siting reflects alternate the A and B house, A and B house, A and B house. And we will come back 
um, to staff when we do sightings and when we sell houses or if we build a house speculative. Um, so this is a prototypical of what the uh, sightings would look like, but may not actually be the final sightings for all of the houses. I would point out that we have four um, special lots um, which require high visibility elevations and they're at the corner of each alley. So there's one in the far left, there are two in the middle and there's one on the far right. Um, next slide, please. This shows the um, two house types that we've selected, I mean, that we've designed, um, and the, them on each lot showing the, the setbacks, um, the five foot front, the four foot side, and the three foot year, rear have all been met and um, satisfied the conditions of the zoning and the design guidelines. Um, a lot of detail here, um, and I can get into it if you'd like, but let's go to the next slide for now. Um, this is all six elevations for the two houses in, a, again, a prototype streetscape. Um, and I'm gonna go into each one, but this is a street view of the six elevations. Uh, next slide, please. A house, uh, next slide, please. So the A house, this is our um, a, a one elevation and some features I'd like to point out that this is a gabled roof house. Um, we have two out of the six elevations, we have two houses with a gable roof and, and four with um, steep hips. Um, it ref it's hard to tell, but those are precast headers above each window. There's a canopy um, that D Jasmine alluded to over the front door. Um, the, the front doors, it's hard to tell here, are recessed two feet, so there's a little vestibule in, so, you know, so there's a little space when you enter the house. Um, and there's some brick corbeling along the uh, first floor that you'll notice. And there's also a precast band basically running across the, between the first and second floor, between the door and the oval window at the center. Um, next slide, please. This is the A2, which shows the steep hip roof. Um, the reverse gable in the center is a predominant feature of this elevation. It's raised um, about a foot above the fascia line, sort of a Richardsonian kind of architecture. We, before, when we were designing these homes, we, we, we toured extensively through the, the Crown Farm Village neighborhood too, and saw Warmold's designs, a lot of the townhomes. And, and so we wanted something that would be harmonious and that would be complementary to the neighborhood, but yet unique and show our, our design styles. You'll notice there's some herringbone details in the uppermost part of the gable. Um, there's a pediment in the top of the gable, a little feature. Um, there's again, a precast band. This one's a, a single, you'll see houses have single precast bands, double precast bands. All the headers again are precast and the center window has precast on four sides. Uh, whereas the other ones have brick returns and brick um, um, at the base. Um, next slide. This, this house is a, does not have the raised reverse gable, but as more Victorian, the, the, um, the gable is very steep um, at 12, 18 pitch actually. The, there's a precast band right below the, um, the sort of running across the the top of the ceiling of the first floor in this house. Those are actually half round bays, bay windows, um, again, to create diversity and, and, and visual appeal of the streetscape. And, um, and they have a circle and, and there's a, 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 a cementitious siding on the bottom of the, uh, the, the bay. Um, so those are the three elevations. Um, I wasn't sure, but if you go to the next slide, the A house is, these lots provided a particular opportunity that we wanted to take advantage of, and that was to have a master bedroom on the first floor home. So real quickly, as you enter this house, you have a two-story foyer on your left. And as you walk down the center hall, uh, the master bedroom entrance is on the right. There's a two closets, a master bath with, you know, there's multiple options on on fitting out that, that master bath with soaking tubs and, 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 um, and the like. A very large dining room on the left, and then you have the family eating and living area with the family room and a kitchen and a large island. 
Um, again, they're rear load garages. Um, so that's the garage in the rear. Next slide, please. This is the second floor. This house has a dual master, which is popular uh, with master bedroom down. So as you come up, there's volume or open space in that, in that center hall area. And there's three bedrooms upstairs, one of which is a full master, and then there's a loft. And then there's an optional deck off of that loft on the ceiling, of, uh, on the roof of the garage, if you will. Um, next slide. And this is the basement. Um, these are all buried basement, and we have multiple uh, window windows in the basement. But we also offer, as Jasmine alluded to, we have to have one ingress, egress window well with a full height window by code. But we offer other full height windows, which is a popular option um, to get more light in a buried basement. Next slide, please. This is the high visibility uh, side elevation. Um, and I wanna thank uh, Jasmine and Greg and Larry Frank um, for all their help in, in, in fine tuning this. Um, it, it's, it's really much better due to everybody's input. Um, you'll notice that the brick return is, I, well, you wouldn't notice, it's 13 feet, eight inches on that right side of your, of your uh, screen. Um, the windows are all in that third, on the second level are all in the two story space of the, um, the stairwell. And we had to put a panel below that because otherwise the window would be right in the middle of the stairwell, if, if that makes any sense. Um, we added a bay window. We centered the, the, the small window above, which is a bathroom. The two windows on the far left at the top are in the master. And the two paneled window panels below that are actually the kitchen. Again, not a place where we couldn't put any windows, but we added these panels, which I think gives it great symmetry. And because of this house being a master bedroom down, it's quite deep house. So we designed the house to sort of look like this, the latter part of the house is in addition to the major part of the house with that shed roof. And that is actually the family room. And when, we, when I show you the rear, we have this detail that we like where we do casement windows with uh, square transom windows above and we do a bank of them on the rear wall and they, they're quite dramatic inside the house and we're carrying those around the side on either side of the fireplace that you see there. Um, and the water table continues all the way across the house. So that's our special side. The, the details, the, the dental molding, the fascia, all all the details that are on the front carried forward on the side, the standing seam metal roof, et cetera, the windows, the window, you know, two over two, uh, whatever the window format will follow in the uh, side elevation. So let me, let me ask you real quick. Sure. You're, you're talking about um, the windows being panels, so there's some sort of a spandrel or infill. The two windows that are lined with the kitchen, which are the two kind of in the middle of this elevation to the left of the bay window, why wouldn't you have real windows in the kitchen? Because it because looks like there's no natural light back in that part of the house at all. We think there's a lot of light in the back of the house, but the, the reason is, is we need countertops and, and upper cabinets. And we would lose them if we did that. But that would just be a function of how you laid out the, the kitchen itself. That's not, you know, I mean, there's lots of houses that have kitchen windows. I, I, but okay, that, that clarifies it. I just want to get a question in there on what that was. And then you said the forward one is in the brick, the brick field. That's aligned with the head of the rest of the first floor windows, but it falls where the stairs are. So you had to do something to reconcile that, I guess. Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. Exactly. <clears throat> um, next slide, please. So these are the three front elevations repeated again, and these would be the standard conditions. Um, what's, what's our standard brick return? So the standard brick return on interior lots is five foot one inch. These show um, lots of different options. We decided to show them um, to illustrate the houses. Um, we, if you look at the, the standard left side elevation, um, this is where we sort of started um, with Jasmine and Greg. And you can see how the side elevation, I think, is a lot stronger. Um, we, 
this, the small square windows, we find that very dramatic in a stairwell and it, and it sort of, it goes up with the stairwell. And given the fact that these houses are close together, having full height windows is great on an end condition, but on an interior lot is not always the best for privacy. So this has been a, a popular solution for us um, in dealing with um, neo-traditional houses on small lots and in tight situations. Um, the rear of the house, we haven't talked about that very much. I'm sorry, do you have a question? I have a, yes, I have a question. On the standard elevation, the shed roof, if somebody does not want the deck on top of the, uh, the family room, we'll say, does that shed roof thing extend all the way across? No, because there are full height windows there. It would, it would just, what is the material we use there? PD. Uh, the, when they don't buy the, the optional deck above the garage, we, we put a rubber membrane up EPDM there. Rubber. Uh, it, there's a rubber EPDM rubber membrane to um, avoid water penetration into the house. Right. Um, so but, the, but the if, roof over the garage is flat regardless. Yes, okay. exactly. Okay. Thank um, you. Um, so in the rear elevation, the standard elevation, you can see the bank of uh, casements and um, square window um, transoms and then the door that sort of mimics the casements adjacent to it. Um, and the, the small transoms on the sloped roof are in that second master bedroom because they're not, if, you do, if we slope the roof, we, we're not able to get um, a full height window. But that bedroom has windows on the side, um, but we wanted a lot of windows in the loft, so that's why we went to a flat roof over the garage in the rear. And we plan that most people will buy the deck, and if we're building speculative homes, we would include the deck. Right. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna uh, jump to the B house architecture. Next slide, please. This is the uh, B1 house. Um, it also has, all, all of our homes have the two foot um, um, recessed entry and have different canopy styles. We're, they're all very rich in, in precast. Again, this one has an arch over the front window above the door um, to mimic the arch of the canopy. Um, it has two um, uh, precast uh, bands running across the house. Um, high water table, transom windows, and the dental molding. Um, it, it, this is more of our Adams Federal, you know, standard home. And um, we think it's quite elegant. Uh, next slide, please. This is the B2. This has a very broad and, and, lo and low reverse gable on the high pitched hip. It's also raised in sort of a Richardsonian um, nod to Richardsonian architecture. There's a pediment at the top of the gable. We have precast running across the reverse gable. There's a precast square, um, you know, note that we've added in the peak of the gable. Again, there's a double precast band at the first floor and precast over all the doors and precast surrounding the front window. Um, next slide, please. Hey, can I ask a quick question sure. about this um, B B three? Um, those those windows at the roof level, are those faux. Faux, yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. Sometimes we put a window, and sometimes we put a um, a grill. Yeah, um, I was asking because of the loft, but the loft is on the back, right? And it's on the second floor. Yeah, yeah, There's it's not. No... So that wouldn't be part of the loft, I guess. Correct. That's correct. This house it has bay windows flanking the door. These are square bays um, with a metal hip roof, standing seam metal. There's again, three bands of precast running across this one. Again, there's some nod to Richardsonian architects with the barrel vault um, raised gable or barrel raised in the center. Um, and there's precast surrounding the front um, uh, center window. Um, but this is a, these are box bays, not half round bays. Again, to create some diversity in architecture and streetscape. Um, next slide, please. 
This house is a master bedroom up. So you enter the home uh, again in the center, similar stair to the A house. The first room on your right is either a living room, a library, there's options to close it, add fireplaces. It's a very much a swing room. Um, the next room on your right is a dining room, um, which flanks the, the kitchen with a large, very large island and a very large kitchen. Um, and a family room in the rear with fireplace. And the, the, the closet that is in that mud room, all the houses have mud rooms, but the closet in this house, because it's a master bedroom up, is convertible to a um, elevator. Um, that option is shown somewhere on this page. Yeah, it's on the far left. Um, top far left is the elevator. Um, next uh, slide, please. There's four bedrooms up here. Again, the stairwell is in a two-story space, um, which our buyers seem to like. We don't typically do two-story spaces in family rooms or other big spaces, but in stairwells, we find them a very sculptural element that uh, we, we like. Um, we have lots of bathroom options. It is possible for each and every bedroom to have its own um, private bath. Um, the closet, in the center, the large linen walk-in, if you will, is the place where the um, uh, elevator would go and you'd, re you'd reconfigure that laundry room to accommodate that, which are all those options on the right side. The master's in the rear um, with a, a very large bathroom, optional fireplace, standing, the, the bathroom has a standing um, tub that, uh, and a private commode and the double bowl vanity on the far end of the, the unit. Excuse me, next slide, please. This is very similar to the A house in that there's one standard egress ingress window uh, with a window well, but again, to accommodate um, more light in the basement, we offered in other locations to add light to the basement. Um, next slide, please. This is the um, high visibility elevation for the B house. The stairwell treatment is very similar um, in that it's a very similar stair. So there's the three um, large windows on the second floor and the panel below it. And the windows on the second floor are all in bedrooms. The two panels in the center are again the kitchen um, in which we added panels rather than full windows because we know our buyers really like storage and cabinets and, 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 and that's the rationale for that. And again, a similar treatment around the fireplace where we repeat the casement windows and the um, fixed uh, transoms, square transoms above. And this house, rather than having a deck over um, a living area like the other house over the garage, we did an outdoor space that's optional that could be one level or two levels. And given that it could be two levels, we showed both, um, both options being selected um, on this house. Um, next slide, please. These are the three elevations together. And again, showing um, the um, standard side elevations in rear. Um, again, less light on these because of um, the closeness of the houses. And um, a lot of the windows shown on here are optional, but we've shown them um, so you can get a full picture of what the potential could be. Um, and the rear is a very similar treatment of the family room, which is sort of a signature of ours, which is those casements. Again, the bank of casements with the uh, family room door to get to the outside. Um, next slide, please. Our color palettes, um, I'll quickly go through this. We have, I think, 16 schemes. We have 16 schemes for 21 lots. There are eight bricks selected. Um, Larry Frank worked hard on this with us. We went back and forth a lot. And we, we really span almost all, all types of brick. We have um, a light pink. We have a, a, some browns, we have some deep reds, and we have some traditional um, uh, red brick. Um, 
lots of them, I, we, we like brick that looks like it's been hand molded, that has an authentic, authentic quality to it. So we, none of them are wire cut bricks. They're all, um, I think, I think the, I'm not sure how they're made, but they're like machine tumbled so that they have irregularities on the face and the edges and, and create an, I think what looks like a very authentic molded brick. Um, they'll cost a little more, but I think they look better. And there's a wide variety. And as part of the design guidelines, you know, we won't use the same colors next to each other or adjacent to each other. Same with elevations, they will always have to be apart from each other. Um, I next slide, please. Again, more color schemes. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So that's the bulk of my um, presentation. Um, I do have some appendix items. I think I'd like to go to one of them real quickly because it's alluded to in the staff report. And it's something we pointed out to staff. I'll tell you the number. Uh, Brian, real quickly, um, go to actually um, thirty eight. This is a um, well, we might w actually let's start on. I'm sorry. It'd be easier to understand if we start with the site plan rather than jump to the elevation. If we jump to sheet seven, excuse me. If you notice lot one on the far left side, lot one is a, a truncated lot. It is narrow, quite narrow at the front and, and broader at the rear. Um, and our B house fits on the lot, but it, it requires the house to be pushed back approximately 11 feet. And we pointed this out to staff and, and we volunteered to treat lot two as sort of a semi high visibility lot, if you will, even though it's not noted in the design guidelines. Um, because of that slight exposure of 11 feet, even though the balance of the house is hidden by the house on lot one. So now if you could jump to package page 38. So on this, what we did is, we, we uh, copied the same detail that was on the um, high visibility, whereas we wrapped the brick a full 13 feet, eight inches on this, and the, and, which is beyond the 11 feet. And the rest of the house, we, we did not extend the, the um, high visibility features as the, the house adjacent to it will be blocking that. We also, to further address this condition, if you could jump to sheet, 35, we are proposing that the landscaping be carry all the way around that 11 feet or 13 feet, eight inches um, to uh, it further enhance the, the, that slight exposure of the, the, the front 11 feet of that house, um, which we think addresses um, the, the issue that, that otherwise might appear to, to exist. Um, we worked hard with staff to solve that problem and um, a combination of ideas led to these, these couple of solutions to solving that. Um, that's really the only extraordinary item um, that I'm aware of that, we, that might be a little bit out of the ordinary um, in our elevations and our sightings. Um, and I welcome any and all questions and our team's here to assist me with that. Let me jump in on a couple. Um, by the way, is it Michael or Harris? Per Payne, oh, that's a, that's Payne a, with Harris Schwab. That's a great question, um, Mr. Bauer. Um, there is no Michael Harris. Um, he doesn't exist. He's a, it's a fictitious name. No, no, I know, but you, you interviewed yeah, My brother's you. name was Michael, and my name is Harris. Okay, I got it. And um, my brother passed away a number of years ago, unfortunately, but... Um, the, it, it's it's our business name, Michael Harris Homes, and I, I'm I'm familiar with that. I was I was thank you for that, and, and, yeah. and sorry about your brother. Um, let me get to one of the big ideas here. So um, there are the two house plans, and in, if you look at the site plan on page seven, but you don't need to call it up right now. But if if we need to get to it, we can. And and the the concept is 
every other one is sort of staggered on the rear. So there's a, there's a shallow model and there's a deep model, essentially. Um, and what I'm curious about is why the shallow model, the less, the one that's shorter, wasn't pushed back from the front and that one of the options could be um, front porches, um, given the, the sort of new urbanist quality of the, of the streetscape and the neighborhood in general. Well, for, in looking at the community, we didn't see this as a front porch kind of community. Um, there, that's a more colonial look, and we went with a more urban brick look, and that's why we stayed away from the full front porch. And we wanted the front elevations to all line up, which is a, a mainstay of neo-traditional <laughs> design. Um, and there are no examples in the Wormold or the other single family in the community of full front porches. So it was sort of to be harmonious and compatible. And there will be lots of things going on in the rear because the, the ones that are short are the ones that offer the two-story deck in the right. rear, which would make them sort of align in the rear when that, and if we don't build them, most people do end up building them on their own afterwards. Okay. Um, and then the other, I want to get back to the, the question I had earlier about the um, blanked out windows on the high visibility elevations. Are there no opportunities to rearrange the floor plans so that the windows, on, at least on the high visibility plans, can be real windows? We studied that ad nauseum with um, our architect and with staff um, when originally we had no windows and we added the panels later. Um, the a large kitchen is is critical to the marketing of these homes and we think it would be a real um, it would hurt the plant significantly um, and we've lived in and we've built homes similar to this we don't believe there's a light issue we think that the the values created through the um, the, the kitchen um, being having a long line of cabinets um, it's what the market's looking for yeah, I think my concern is that it, because it's a high visibility elevation, the whole point was to engage the street and sort of be a part of the streetscape. And, and I don't know that a, a blank window does that. Um, it, it might need to be something else where you might need to talk more about whether real real windows can be introduced there. But, um, and, I'll, and I'll defer to you in terms of whether the kitchen itself is big enough or not and, and how much of it needs to have, how much cabinetry needs to be there to be a marketable. Um, but I'll stop with those questions for now and open it up to um, the other commissioners. Looks like Danny, your hand went up. Yeah, um, I had a quick question. Can you talk about where the um, utilities would be outside? Because um, I saw it look. It looks like I saw like where the electrical utility is. But is everything going to be clustered together? It's but actually presentations are showing. Well, do you have a? Do you want to jump in and answer? Can you? I'm going to defer to Jenny Spicer on our team, who knows. I, I believe they're all in the they're all in the rear. Okay. So, so what page? Sorry, one second. Excuse me, Jenny, but you're going to have to uh, unmute yourself, ma'am. Could you go to sheet eight? Oh, that's not. I had to force mute you again, Jenny. I apologize. Is she, is she, Jenny, are you logged in on two different um, platforms that's in the same meeting? No. Harris is fairly close to me. We're in a long conference room. That's probably so it then. That's it. Relocating at the moment. Um, so on this sheet, um, you can see our typical sightings. And you can see that the gas meter is typically located on the garage side of the house. This is yeah. partly because of the different code requirements for the gas meter not to be near other ignition sources. and. Um, windows and that sort of thing. So the gas meters are typically located on the garage side towards the rear. 
this plan shows those locations, the electric meter is located on the opposite side on the rear corner, mm -hmm. which is also shown on this plan. And, and are those little square boxes, are those the AC compressors yeah. there? Yes, they are. Okay. okay. So because there was so much in these side yards, you know, we have the egress window well. Yeah. Um, yeah. From, from house to house. We do have in our appendix, which shows our landscape drawings that we have screened those AC units. Okay. Yeah, I was, I mean, yeah, they, those light lots are so tight. I was just wondering where everything was. Yes. Yeah. And we, our architecturals also show alternate egress window well locations so that when we site houses next to each other, depending on the options, we can stagger those. So they're not back to back on any yeah, given so, one. So they would never be on the same side of um, on, on they, a given they house could, that's right next to each other, right? But they could be on the same side if somebody purchased a, a finished basement den that could be on the opposite side of the house, but they will always, um, they will never line up with each okay. other. Okay. They'll okay. be several feet off. Okay. Thank you. Matt, did you have something? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to go back to the side elevations, the A unit side, side elevation. I'm sorry, the. Um, corner unit, corner lot, uh, side elevations. And, and Harris, if you could just, you know, expand on why uh, it's never comfortable where we stop uh, masonry and begin siding. Uh, it's always a difficult um, decision to make, and I understand that. But on the corner lots, uh, the, you know, where you chose to stop them, uh, I don't quite understand. You have these beautiful, you know, really well done front facades. I mean, incredibly well done. <laughs> and great uh, roofs uh, with great dental supports. And it's just, it's a wonderful detail. And then the, the you know, basic tectonics are that, that now this beautiful roof on this uh, corner lot sits on a small portion, maybe 20% of its brick and the rest of its siding. And it doesn't quite make sense to me. Uh, and to, to, you know, before you explain, you know, uh, off of John's comment, I, I don't quite understand the trade-off of saving the money on the masonry on those A facades on those corner lots, and then and then introducing you know uh, some spandrel windows, which you know is fakery and trickery. I, I think Jasmine did a great job of trying to balance the facade with you, uh, uh, and I understand where that came from. But at the, from a trade-off standpoint, for me, I don't quite the the elevation doesn't make sense to me. So if you could explain a little more to how you got to where you were on this a lot elevations, that'd be great. Yeah, if you could turn to um, page forty-five of the packet, forty-four. Let's start on forty-four. Again, what we were doing was is looking at what was happening in Crown and other areas and, and trying to put our spin on it and, and hopefully do it even better. And so this is a house on a corner lot. Now, if we could go to the next page, that was the, the stone on that. And there are lots of examples of this all throughout Crown um, on Wormold singles where there's this sort of arbitrary ending of the, the stone or the brick. Um, I don't have a better explanation for that than precedent, frankly. Um, yeah, so Harris, so I think this is a great example, right? So, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to get into an aesthetic uh, discussion, you know, Phil, that's Phil's job, right? The, uh, the, uh, I think, but, you know, this is a clear idea of where a really well-designed roof comes and lands on one kind of material and a different roof lands on a different kind of material and and it and it just tectonically kind of makes sense uh, and you guys put so much effort and you know really sort of uh, did a brilliant job with your facade and then you turn the corner with the this great roof line and it and it falls on two different materials so tectonically it just uh, uh, which is this dumb architectural word but it's you know it just i have a harder time this, this elevation made sense to me when it was presented to us, and it kind of makes sense now in your photographs, uh, as to why, you know, how they made this transition. Uh, and, and your side elevation, I, I, just, I just don't see it. And, and I'm less worried about, um, frankly, compliance with our, our master plan than I am, you know, uh, uh, anything that we might have done uh, to have you compromise your, um, 
you know, your overall design intent uh, and end up with a design that isn't quite going to meet your market. So I'm, I'm more worried about, uh, you know, how, how did you get to that side elevation that you have now? Uh, you know, and, and is there a way to have it make some more sense similar to this elevation that you have up here? I don't, I don't know the answer to that question without, you know, going back to the drawing board, frankly. Um, if you go back to sheet, um, Seventeen of the packet. Um, you know, there, there, there's. Given that we have a, a a linear roof and don't have multiple roofs crashing down, um, uh, you know, I'm not sure how to create that. I mean, maybe there's some um, architectural thing we can do. I, I I don't know off the top of my head. I'm not an architect, but. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I don't speak for the for the council. But uh, would it be a trade off to get rid of the false windows and bring the brick all the way along that side? I'm not sure that. I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Um, if we did take the brick all the way across, let's say the two story element, and you took out the 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 um, fake the panels. Which, by the way, there's a great historical precedent for this. It, 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 you know, we can call it trickery, but if you go in Old Town, Alexandria, Georgetown, Frederick, you will see headers with um, bricked in or or wooden fake shutters all the time, and yeah. it's it's not trickery. I, th I I think that's I think that's a strong word to describe this practice. That's fair. That's fair. Um, it, it has long historical precedent and I could show you hundreds of pictures of houses that are 50, 70, 100 years old that have a similar detail. Um, and of all the glass that's on these houses, 90% um, of it is real glass. There's, there's three on this entire house. Um, the that's front true. And, I, and I'm not objecting to them. I, I'd like both, frankly. I'd like... <laughs> I'd like a, a bricked in false window uh, in order to create pattern and texture at the pedestrian level and have a full uh, masonry facade underneath, underneath the roof at the two story piece. But, um, but uh, I'm, I was starting to negotiate with you and I shouldn't do that. So we'll, uh, uh, I'll let the rest of the council sort of chime in. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, so, since Matt told me it was my job to comment on aesthetics, um, I, I, I agree with everything that, that that Matt said, including the praise for the front elevations, I think they're I think they're beautiful. I think I think the concerns here are are valid with this elevation. You know, typically you, you transition materials at a corner, um, either an inside corner or an outside corner, which which the example elevation you you brought up did very well. Um, I I think I totally understand the 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 struggles of trying to balance different price points materials and how much of what uh, material is on the, on the project. But, you know, looking at this, at this elevation, you know, that, that brick wants to go all the way to the back corner. And then you, you know, the real precedent for having a, a sort of doghouse addition off the back in, in siding historically is all over the place. Um, to the, to the point about the infill windows, I, again, I don't, I don't have a strong objection Either way, the the bricked-in window opening with the header that's there and sort of the bricked-in opening is a much a much more you know historically appropriate way to deal with a fake window than a, you know a, a five-pon window stuck in the middle of the siding. So again, I the 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 fake windows don't bother me to a, a point of you know strong objection. I think you can they're they're necessary. We've used them on and recommended them on many other of these elevations to help balance the elevation. Um, again, I, if, if the option was presented to either do this or, you know, have that whole facade be brick and those windows just be a, a, a header with a slight relief in the brick, you know, with the look of a bricked in window, I think that would be my, my preference or recommendation um, for how to sort of balance this high vis eleva elevation a little more. Could I ask you to go to sheet, um... Um, C 
seven in your packet. Um, I'd like to point out where these high visibility are. They're both alleys. They're not roads. No cars go down them except people that want to park in their home. Um, the, the, the far left, lot one, it faces the rear of townhomes that are going to be all siding, have doors, garage doors, a lot less attractive than what I'm building in the exact same line of sight when you're driving down this road in the opposite direction. The two in the middle are an alley um, and not very wide, I would point out. And the one on the far right isn't on an alley at all. It's just an open space that I don't even know. I think that's probably part of the school site. Um, so though these are high visibility corners, um, I would argue that they're, they're minor high visibility corners and um, and don't warrant the 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 level of detail you're asking for and cost that you're asking for um, but you are the planning commission and it's your decision but I would ask you to consider that in your decision let me add one more question to it did you all look at a way to do yes. it, assuming that the um, the the brick turns the corner and transitions maybe in a little better way or as it relates to the roof but that whole front corner has something to do with the stairway it's an interesting kind of two-story space inside the house it's different than all the rest of the house all that kind of stuff and and again if you know a historical precedent what you will see a lot of is windows that follow the stair they don't they don't they're not beholden to a to a header um where the rest of the floor is sometimes they follow the mid mid elevation window that aligns with the landing or, or there's a couple smaller ones that follow the stairs up, but whatever it might be. Did you guys look at something like that? Um, to avoid Mr. having the spandrel. Mr. Bauer, um, that's where we started. That was our original design. Um, but staff felt strongly against it. Okay. John. Sure. May, I, may I join? Uh, quick question about the fact, first of all, let me echo, what my fellow commissioners said about the frontages. I really enjoy them. I like them. Uh, I think they're, they're very attractive. You've got six different elevations and 21 houses. Is there going to be any provision for varying the, the elevations from building to building so that you do allow for the variation of the roof lines and the, and the bricks and so on and so forth? Or if I come in as a customer and say, I want to have one uh, that's just like the one next door, Will you allow that or will no. that there be a different design? The design guidelines prohibit that. And we wouldn't do that anyway. You know, we, that, that's not what Michael Harris Holmes does. I mean, and as far as the, as far as the key lots, the ones that we saw, the elevations that we've seen just now, yes. um, will those be the ones that will be designated for those particular th uh, four lots? Yes, but it could be the A or B. We, we, the only one we know for sure is lot one has to be a B. Lot one, okay. The other three could be an A or a B, depending upon market conditions. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, commissioners, any other questions? No? All right. Um, and we don't have anybody, um, Brian confirmed, we don't have anybody from the public speaking tonight or commenting on this. Sir. So where we are in the process then is um, staff's recommendation. Um, so the staff recommends that the planning commission hold the record open on AFP-8515-2020 until 5 p.m. on Thursday, July 9th of 2020 and defer final action until Wednesday, July 15th of 2020. Um, Jasmine, it's kind of a sidebar. I meant to call today and ask, but um, in our last couple of meetings, we went forward with um, approvals on site plan applications during our meetings. What, um, why is the recommendation tonight to defer the decision tonight? I can answer that. Those other um, applications that came before you were some of them to, were to address previous conditions of approval okay. um, that the commission had already uh, put on those plans or those plans. Um, any new plans that the commission is seeing for the first time, our recommendation is to hold the record open um, because of the, again, we're in this remote virtual meeting. Right. Um, okay. And we understand there could be a lot of technical difficulties. Maybe people may have a difficult time getting on or watching this. Um, so that's why our recommendation is to hold the record open. And this is consistent with, with one or two of the other new applications we've seen. So 
that that makes sense too. Okay. Um, all right, um, commissioners, what's your what's your thinking on the on the conversation tonight and and where things stand? And anybody who wants to jump in, please do. Matt, go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'll start with a little more praise and uh, and really, um, I'm excited to see these built. Uh, you know, uh, I I often in this seat or well not this seat but at the dais rail against sort of mid mid Atlantic colonial contextualism and sort of bad historical detailing or uncomfortable historical detailing and I think you guys really both understand it and execute well uh, and uh, and you know given what you've built in the city already at the other end of Crown Farm uh, I'm excited to see these built so uh, thank you for that uh, the the as as I think Lloyd and Phil and everybody said it's, it's really great um, Great front elevation. I, I still don't understand. I just don't intrinsically understand the A lots. I, I hear your argument that, uh, and you're right, um, that uh, all um, four of the sort of A side elevations that you have are, are secondary A sides. Well, I don't know, A minus, I don't know what that is. But yeah. the, uh, that, uh, and that certainly uh, like you're, you're the first, the, the most eat Western, you know, is facing the backside of of townhomes that are have not taken care to turn turn their backside to you. Uh, so why should you turn you know a, a fine side to them? Uh, is uh, probably not an argument that wins many battles with me, uh, but I understand it. Uh, the one I'm probably most worried about is the elevation that faces east into the school lot. Uh, I think that actually will end up being a fairly pedestrian heavy uh elevation um mm -hmm. and i think you'll get a lot of folks walking along it or near it or will certainly see it and view the future value of those homes you know uh past uh when you sell them um you know in 20 years and 10 years when uh, the homeowner that buys them from you sells them to someone else uh will become a critical component and will contribute to the what i think is the aesthetic uh, importance of this neighborhood. So, uh, so Matt, hey Matt, real quick, I'm sorry to jump in, but um, can Jasmine, can you pull up one of the illustrative site plans um, that kind of clarifies what's happening at the end there? The the actual site plan and the presentation is a very light kind of black and white. It doesn't have a lot of detail. Yeah, I don't remember an overall site plan in the in the package. No, and there's one of an there's an overall map in the presentation, but that end is sort of it's really blotted out by a big red boundary line. So I don't know if you've got something else better, Jasmine, that would show what the real condition is at the end. Could you go to sheet six? That might help. And if you could close up on yeah, even more on the crown east. There you go. So, so understanding that that red line is actually a street, you know, a fairly major, what in, you know, someday in the future will end up being a major street that runs down that, that uh, property line. But I think it uh, stops, uh, I, I no, think it stops at the front, at the main street in front of these houses. It doesn't go beside it. Uh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, however, that, that means that it becomes a, you know, major route into the property. It becomes what will be, a, you know, a, a, a relatively important entry into the community as you drive to what will be a future school site, we all hope, uh, and will almost certainly be, uh, that, that, that that facade, that corner becomes something more important, you know, to, to Harris's point than the alley entries along the, the mid block. You know, th this plan doesn't really show that that's actually a street. And once there's- I would, I would there, clarify one thing that the, the street on the far, I guess, east side, doesn't extend all the way to the end of our easternmost house. Yep. It, it, it makes a right, it, maybe this isn't the best. Uh, no, and John made that point and we understand okay. it. Okay, so, okay. So, but, but even as it turns there, you're still, you've got what is almost a thousand feet of drive up, right, to, to this single house and you're turning. And then, so it, imagine if you will, that future school site becomes a, a fairly major, as any high school site would, community destination, right? Uh, everything from football games to, uh, to theater nights to, you know, my kids have just graduated from high school. I understand how much time and how many people uh, uh, spend time at, at high school sites. It becomes a major community hub, 
right? And, and that street that runs along that, the face of that school site becomes a major ingress to the entire neighborhood. Um, and Matt, I, I, I can't disagree with you there. Um, I, 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 I do see that as a more prominent um, condition. If you could pull that back up, Jasmine, you know, one solution, you know, the, the brick return even two feet is not a historical detail, as we all know. Yeah. And, and on the interior lots, let me throw a crazy idea out at you and, and see if this works is on the, the unit that you're talking about, maybe we do go to all brick on that one, but the other three, maybe from corner to corner is cementitious siding. And then there's a roof that rests on it and you don't have that, that bizarre detail. Uh, I, I, I think that's a great solution. And uh, I would just say that you probably want to at least turn that corner with two feet of brick so that it, it creates a pilaster of some kind, right? So the, the corner lands on something. So if you could just if you could just turn the corner with a couple of you know rows of brick, uh, yeah, so, I think I think we could do that. Yeah, uh, I, um, I, my, I and, and I'm one of five here, uh, and staff hasn't weighed in, but <laughs> but uh, but I, I think if you just turn that corner and gave it a nice pilaster, something to land on, uh, and then the whole side was siding, I I would think that's a better uh, detail. And if and if we could do a full brick facade that then faces the, the future school site. You know the future. Uh, you know public amenity. It's going to be the you know drama department. There's going to be literally a thousand people staring at that facade uh, every day when once we get a school there. Until then, it's nothing. But hey, Matt. So in, in in the spirit of that, if you do the facade facing the school, that one facade that's that's so exposed and all brick, then then I would imagine the window details become more like the um, blanked out brick windows as opposed to a, a window with. Um, Spandrel glass. Sash. I would certainly recommend that. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. I don't. What was? I didn't understand that. Well, so go to if if you if you could call up the um the a the high visibility elevation. Sure. That's um. um Eric, I think I think as you were explaining to us, actually, the historically more accurate probably is to infill that void of the window underneath. Yeah, that's what that's what these are. Yeah. Well, you know, infill it with brick, right? Well, if we're going to us on the, the full brick elevation, yeah, they would, yeah. we would fill them in with brick. Right. But on the siding ones, we'd fill them in with um, a, 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 a paneling detail. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. We, would, we could change those. Yeah. Well, I, I understand the comment now. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. I put some logic to this. And, and yeah, I, I jumped right in with, you know, um, talking about what concerned me about these, but but I I do have to reiterate what the other commissioner said is the front elevations have really gone gone a long way in in establishing a, a nice quality for the streetscape. Um, I'm a little disappointed there isn't an option to do more with the front porch or front stoop that's covered, but um, I, I get it. I understand what you're what you're what you're picking up on in terms of precedent along that that segment of the, of the neighborhood. Um, so Jasmine, th this conversation is moving towards, I think, a condition where we need to identify the lots we're talking about specifically. Can, can you do that just so we make a good record of this? With the commission holding the record open, actually, um, I think Harris could actually amend his plans to have them revised, hopefully, okay. for you guys okay. uh, when, at your next planning commission on the 15th. Okay. I, I think I understand what you're proposing and asking me to do, and we could revise, create two end conditions, one in all brick and one with a brick pilaster and right. show you the detailing for that and amend our application. Okay. When would you need that? When would you need that, Jasmine? Um, so the record closes on July 9th, Thursday. So I would need to have all that back next Thursday. <laughs> next Thursday. <laughs> and it's a holiday weekend. That's, no that's why I asked. <laughs> we'll, we'll make it work. <laughs> okay. That'd be wonderful. Even if it's a sketch over, you know, I think uh, I'm sure you can get it done with notes. And that would be easy. It's the, yeah. if you wanted hard line architecture, that, that's what's time consuming with these CAD drawings. Um, Commissioner, anything else in the presentation you want to um, address or comment, um, make comment on? I, I just have a, it's more a question to, of curiosity. I'm not sure it, it impacts the approval or not, but you've got these great, elevations with these great, you know, high roof lines. 
I didn't see attic access or access for occupiable third floor space in any of them. Is it, is that an option for people? We, we decided against that um, in that in doing market research on other houses, the extensive amount of stairs is, you know, that's, that's more townhome living. We, we went, these lots are much deeper than the warm old houses. And you can tell that by the side elevations and why we did that sort of addition kind of looking thing on the A house. They're very, very deep. And so we're able to get the square footage on a more horizontal plane, which is how people live, um, as opposed to a more vertical plane. And that's why we decided against it. We, we were able to get the square footages we need in a more traditional um, two living levels. Okay. And, and I want to clarify one quick thing on, on site dimensions. Um, you mentioned you'll come back for um, actual siting, final siting when the, when the, uh, the houses are, are um, under contract. On the long version, is there still, and I don't, I don't actually know if there's a detail in here. Maybe there is. Uh, there is. It's the page after the overall site plan. The dimension from the garage, I'm talking about the, the deepest unit, the dimension from the garage door closed to um, what effectively is the alley edge. And I'm not sure if you're doing curb and gutter or just doing um, run out on the, on the asphalt, but is that still more than a car's length? Yes, that that's also an element of the design guidelines. But if you go, there is a, a slight nuance to that. Um, Mr. Bauer, so I would ask you to go to sheet seven. If you look at the first large span of houses on the left side, those all have 18 feet minimum for a second car between the garage door and the alley per the design guidelines. The four lots on the far right have an exception to them. Can you go to those four lots? Those do not, and they were not required in the design guidelines, and it's not possible because they're very shallow lots. Mm. Okay. So all the houses do meet that, that condition um, that you request. And if you go to the next sheet, page eight, it shows this in much more detail. The, the group on the left, you'll see that there is a driveway for two spaces. Thank you for highlighting that, Brian. And the four lots on the right do not have parking in their driveway. Okay. Uh, and as you can see from this illustration, they're much, it's because they're shallow, much shallower lots. Right, right. The alley has to cut back a little bit because of the stormwater manager or the property exactly. line, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, and I would uh, I would argue, John, that uh, that's a good use of the four end dead end townhomes. That uh, you know, should somebody park in the wrong spot and block other folks, that uh, you know who to go, whose door to go and knock on. It's not right. not a matter of blocking an alley with twenty homes on it. Right, four lots are not. I mean, that's not going to be a major major. Yeah. Uh, I also major. think the the view from the school site is also, you know, having you know, your Winnebago and your, your boat or whatever you have in your driveway is not the greatest view. So I think from aesthetic perspective, not having cars parked there is probably a good thing too. It forces people to use their drive, their, their garage. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, anything else you want to um, highlight or, or discuss before we, okay, I'm seeing no hands fly up or any. I just, I mean, I just want to echo my, my colleagues that these are just extremely handsome fronts and facades and I really appreciate all the hard work and, and, and time that was um, collaborated with, with the city, um, with city staff. So I appreciate that. I, I appreciate that comment. Um, you know, my other company, it's called Streetscape. I, I take great, I'm a, I was born uh, not in Montgomery County, but I've lived here my whole life since I was six. I build here, I take great pride in what we do. I, I think my, the mission of my company is um, if I design a good product, I'm rewarded for it. So it's sort of a win-win for me. And I, I really, it's, I take a point of pride if you look at all of our projects from Symphony Park to, to um, Copley to what these 21 homes will be. I, I, you know, we really, it's important to me. And um, I take great, we studied a long time Victorian brick homes and, and Richardsonian homes and some of those details can get crazy and wacky and we took the details that we thought were 
that could be introduced in a way that made them unique. But I think like the other commissioner said, a, a reproduction is easy to identify and doesn't look good. It, it, it's, it's taking the details and, and, and utilizing them in a way that, is a, that makes it look right. And that's what we try to achieve. Yeah. Appreciate those comments. Sure. Thank you. The pre you got me a precast from the, when the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so staff is recommending that we hold the record open on AFP 815-2020 until 5 p.m. on Thursday, July 9th, and defer final action until Wednesday, July 15th. Is there a motion, please? So moved. Second. All right, uh, Commissioner Wessel? Aye. Commissioner Hopkins? Aye. Commissioner Kaufman? Aye. Commissioner Winborn? Aye. And I will vote aye as well. Thank you all very much. We'll see you back here in a couple of weeks with those revisions and uh, hopefully on to the next step. Thank you very much for your Thank time. You. I, I know these are difficult times and the fact that you all got together on a Zoom meeting to help the business of the city move forward, we greatly appreciate it from the business community. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Um, that takes us now to our second site plan of the night, which is AFP-8. 8410 2020. Uh, intersection improvements for Crown Neighborhood 1 in the MXD mixed use development zone. And this is an amendment to final plan. And presenting from staff is Caroline Side. And good evening, Caroline. You're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is an amendment to final site plan review, AFP 8410-2020, submitted by David Ramsey of Westwick Properties on February 6, 2020. This application requests approval to modify three intersections within Crown Neighborhood, one from the uh, intersection treatments originally proposed as part of site plan SP 11-0010 due to constructability and materials maintenance concerns. And uh, if we can put on uh, page 275 of the packet, that's the aerial, I'll just orient you to the, the three intersections. So these are the three intersections uh, that are the focus of this um, amendment to final plan. On the bottom left is the intersection at Ellington Boulevard and Diamondback Drive. And then in the center of the aerial is Ellington Boulevard and Crown Park Avenue, the third intersection at Crown Park Avenue and Alcott Place, uh, which is where there's an entrance into uh, one of the garages. Um, Mr. Doug Ramsey from Westbrook Properties is here to present the intersection plans. And uh, Brian, if you can go to page 286, that is the beginning of his presentation. Thank you, Caroline, and good evening, commissioners. Um, as Caroline mentioned, I'm David Ramsey with Seven Crown Farm Owner, um, and we're here tonight to present a final site plan amendment for Crown in Neighborhood One. <clears throat> you could uh, go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> for uh, quick orientation purposes, I know we just looked at this plan uh, with the prior application, um, but to give you a sense of, of where we're talking about, um, this is the overall plan development and the amendment we're presenting tonight is associated with neighborhood one located to the west or on the left side of this plan, specifically as it relates to certain proposed intersection improvements within downtown Crown. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Our currently approved site plan proposed improving six intersections within neighborhood one as shown in the image on the left. And this plan amendment focuses on improving three of those centrally located intersections shown in the image to the right. Next slide, please. We're proposing these changes as a result of concerns we have been discussing with city staff over the past several months, primarily related to constructability and long-term maintenance associated with the improvements on the current site. The approved plans include extensive paper work in the intersections and crosswalks, which would require long-term closures of these highly traveled areas in order to build and install the improvements. This would inevitably result in significant disruptions to the daily vehicular and pedestrian traffic that utilize these roads on a daily basis, which doesn't seem feasible given the majority of downtown Crown is built out and operating at almost full capacity. The other major concern with the current plan is long-term maintenance. Uh, 
uh, city staff, along with Public Works, has expressed concern with maintenance requirements of these pavers over time, as well as the burden of that maintenance getting passed on to the Crown Homeowners Association. Over time, pavers start to loosen and pop out with re regular wear and tear due to traffic, snow plows, and weather. Repairing and replacing these pavers inevitably becomes routine, and in a worst case scenario, water gets through them and penetrates to the subgrade, jeopardizing the adjacent roadway, which evolves into much larger problems. As you know, Public Works has been working to remove some of the existing paver crosswalks throughout the city as a result of similar issues, and we don't want to subject Crown to a similar situation in the future. Our proposed plan, our, excuse me, our proposed plan amendment will activate three primary intersections that serve as transitions or gateways in and out of downtown Crown through a combination of horizontal and vertical improvements. This redesign was a placemaking exercise designed to implement a sense of arrival at each of these highly traveled intersections with decorative stamped asphalt crosswalks, paver banding outside of the roadways, trellises and seat walls, pedestrian archways, and supplemental landscaping. I'll go through each one in more detail on the following slides. Next slide, please. So this is the intersection at Diamondback Drive and Ellington Boulevard. We're proposing to install street print stamped asphalt crosswalks in a brick pattern with white edge banding to frame the intersection. There's an existing entrance column located on the east or right side of the intersection that we will relocate to the median to make it more visible, and we'll also install supplemental landscaping to complement the feature. On the east side of the intersection where the sign used to be, we're proposing to install a wood arbor trellis, central and supplemental seat walls for pedestrian use, branded planter boxes, and additional landscaping to fill out this area and create a high visible, highly visible terminus at the end of this entrance road that comes into the Crown community. Uh, next slide, please. This is the main intersection of downtown Crown at Ellington Boulevard and Crown Park Avenue. Serving as the primary intersection, the fully built out retail on each corner already provides an impactful presence, which is accompanied by significant signage and wayfinding. To complement and further activate this area, we're proposing to install stamped asphalt crosswalks on the four sides of the intersection similar to what we're proposing at Diamondback Drive in an effort to carry a common theme. In addition to the crosswalks, we're proposing to install soldier course paver banding around the existing ADA ramps at each corner, further accenting the intersection and also blending with the adjacent hardscape as there is similar paver banding already installed around some of the retail in the same vicinity. Next slide, please. And this is the third intersection at Crown Park Avenue and Alcott Place, serving as a transition between downtown Crown and the residential neighborhood of Crown West. We're proposing to install a stamped asphalt crosswalk over Alcott, which is a heavily traveled pedestrian corridor utilized by Crown residents that frequent downtown Crown. In addition to the crosswalk, we're proposing to create an archway over the adjacent, adjacent sidewalk by extending the steel trellis overhead. This will create a pedestrian gateway in and out of downtown Crown, further complemented by vine cabling rods on the trellis, as well as supplemental landscaping built into the existing concrete flatwork around that area. In summary, these proposed improvements will activate these primary intersections by creating valuable and long-term enhancements that the residents and guests of Crown can appreciate and enjoy for many years. The stamped asphalt crosswalks can be installed at each intersection in a matter of hours, minimizing the residential traffic, I'm sorry, minimizing the residual traffic disruptions compared to long-term closures required by the papers. We're also gonna work with the city to see if we can schedule these improvements to take place overnight, further minimizing impacts. Maintenance of the improvements will be the responsibility of the Crown Homeowners Association. And as a condition of approval, we will work with staff to accordingly amend the existing non-standard maintenance agreement at Crown to ensure long-term sustainability is achieved. 
Uh, that concludes our presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, would you go back, please, to the page? It was a couple back from where you just stopped. It's it's the intersection of um, Crown Park and Ellington. Uh, right. Oh, there it was. Now the main, the, the four-way. Uh, it's, the, it's the one right after that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how wide are those crosswalks? That is a good question. I think they're ten. They're ten feet. One foot uh, on each side is the white banding, and then eight foot. Oh, really? They are that wide. They they look narrow relative to the scale of the street. But one of the because one of the concerns I think we've had all along is a very strong demarcation of pedestrian um, crossing that, that will stop the traffic. It's not just a, a you know a, an incidental crosswalk. It's something that really needs to slow things down and make make the pedestrian crossings a priority. And right now that's a little bit ambiguous. People don't know when to step out and cars kind of you know sneak past. Um, and I know one way to solve for that is to make the crosswalks very generous, the, the width of them very generous so that it's it's clearly a zone that belongs to the pedestrians and not just incidental. Um, and in this diagram, it look, they look a little narrow, but but we can we can get into that more. Um, the other thing I wanted to clarify, um, I think during the presentation it was said that what what decisions were made about how to um, materially how to make these crosswalks and some of these features um, that you didn't want to saddle the homeowners association with future um, maintenance. These are all city streets, correct? The, the sidewalks would fall under city maintenance, or, or, or do I have that wrong? Maybe Carolyn. Hey. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Caroline. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> so they, they are city streets, Ellington and Crown Park Avenue, at least through this one intersection, mm. um, will be city maintained. However, we have a, a non-standard maintenance agreement with the city that will require the homeowners association to maintain unique improvements such as these crosswalks. Okay. Fair enough, and and you're operating from their their strongest recommendation on how to detail and how to how to build these crosswalks and with the um, the textured asphalt and all of that. Is that is that true? Um, I didn't understand the question. Operating um, well, part of, part of your presentation, um, and we we know this as well, is that the city is going around to different crosswalk installations that have been tried um, over the years. And they're beginning to remove some of the decorative materials that were used or tried. Um, and I just, my point was you have a strong endorsement from City Public Works that this technique for these crosswalks is durable, as appropriate as, as, as they would prefer to see? Um, we have. So we've worked uh, and, and okay. met several times with staff and Public Works, specifically uh, Tony Berger and some other folks. And um, this is what we've landed on as a combination of, of their recommendations and what we think will ultimately be best out there. And and was any part of this, um, it, it, you know, in terms of going back to look at what needed to happen for the pedestrian experience, um, were you, did you check lighting levels, lighting distribution, you know, the, the whole kind of lit environment at night and, and um, think about that at all? Or is it is it something that's already been talked about and resolved? I'm, I'm really not sure where that stands. Um. I don't recall specifically looking at any type of um, lighting plan. I, I mean, I, I do know that those streets are well lit, um, but that is something we could certainly review and make sure that the proper lighting's in place. And, and just to clarify, there are currently crosswalks out there now that are right. being utilized by the pedestrians. This is just um, an enhancement of what's currently out there. Yeah, they're painted. They're not, I, I just don't think they, they do enough to, to really establish the pedestrian zone. They're more, they're more utilitarian. Um, okay, uh, commissioners, any other questions or? Lloyd, please. You're, you're on mute, Lloyd. Lloyd, Lloyd, you're on mute. Okay, sorry. Uh, thermoplastic brick pattern, is that is that what the material is called? It is, uh, that's essentially what it is. It's uh, specifically called Street Print XD. Uh, thermoplastic, so it's a it's a highly durable, um, high quality type thermoplastic. Yes. Do you have any idea of what the longevity is on something like that, with considering the traffic that will be going through there? Because it is a very busy intersection. Sure. So um, we've we've spoken with a few different contractors. One of them, I, I think, we're going to land on for the work. 
Um, again, it depends on the amount of traffic that, that runs over these, but it's something that we could anticipate, you know, being every, you know, four or five, six years, uh, we take a look at not, not necessarily to replace what's there, but maybe refresh what's there. Mm -hmm. um, but what we like about it is that that's a fairly simple exercise. It's, you know, we don't have to tear up the streets to do that. It's essentially just bringing the guys out, preferably in the summer overnight when the temperatures are right. And you can essentially just touch them up as opposed to, to trying to take the road apart to, to rebuild. And my other question revolves around a question that uh, the chairman just asked as well about the lighting, particularly if I look at Crown and um, Ellington, it's uh, slide number, I think, 291. You can bring that up. As you can see, it looks to me that there's only uh, the lighting, uh, there's only, looks like there's one lamppost on the north side, north, I, I call it the northwest corner, and I believe somewhere down on the opposite side. I don't see lighting on all four corners, and that's what concerns me. Uh, we've had situations here in, in Kentlands, for instance, where the lighting was inadequate, although the, uh, they had the brick paving and the crosswalks were all fairly well demarcated. Uh, I would like for you to work with staff, if possible, to look at the lighting more closely, as, as the chairman uh, had indicated, and see perhaps if um, additional lights on the corners would be of assistance to the pedestrians as well. Okay, absolutely. Um, and again, I'm not sure um, if we picked up all of the the lighting as you know specifically on this rendering, but that that's something we'll absolutely double check and make sure well, one that the we'll adequate lighting there. On that if we, when we, we see it again, yeah, if we can identify a, a location that makes sense for an additional light, that's something. Yeah. We'll so the next time we see you in uh, at our next meeting, perhaps uh, we'll be able to have a better idea about that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the only way to really get to that is for a photometric plan to be developed by the engineer and show what the light fixtures do um, before just sort of arbitrarily placing another lamppost. Because it may be fine, but we just need to understand it. Right. I, I, I got you one better than, a, than an engineer. Um, I've got Google Street View. Um, so there is currently a lamppost at every crosswalk. Everywhere a crosswalk touches a curb, there's a lamppost. So there's two lampposts on every corner. Yeah, but what we don't know is whether the light throw is is really producing a safe, brightly lit pathway. We don't. It, it 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 definitely would be worth checking the photometric calcs, but these are not tiny light posts, so yeah, it, it's it's worth doing a double check. But if I was going to bet the money in my wallet, I'd say we're exceeding what we have at many, many, many other intersections of the city. Right, right. And, and there's we'll a lot of ambient light that comes off of the adjacent um, businesses because they're fairly close to the street. So I know it's not it's not dark, but still um, we want to punch up what the pedestrian zone is. And, and look, I think it's um, it's a fairly simple exercise and, and definitely worth going through to yeah. to just look at those photometrics and make sure the lights that are there are adequate and that's something we can certainly do. Sure. All right. Um, also, I think we had the same conversation a decade ago, but... <laughs> John, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, Phil, go ahead. That's yeah, I could, my my one and only concern again is is with the the maintenance of these things. Um, obviously, you have maintenance either way, but you know, I there are there are other examples of these pressed in printed brick asphalt crosswalks around the city, which I don't know when they were installed, but they look in very rough shape and are worn away and the brick patterns worn away. And, and so we, we just need to make sure that whatever maintenance agreement is in place is, is rock solid and stipulates, you know, whether it's periodic assessment by the city or, or what, so that, so that it's not up to the homeowners association to determine when they feel like spending the money to do this, that it's a conditions based assessment. I have, I, I, let me ask the question a different way. I, I, you know, is there something about, um, does Crown need to have a traditional brick crosswalk or are there some other options that make more sense? Um, you know, cause, cause again, if, if it's, you know, a, a painted or a patterned kind of thing, are there other options that just, they don't look as traditional, but they're still as vibrant and still as interesting and protect the, 
protect the pedestrians and you know create kind of a sense of place in the middle of the intersection. I don't know. I mean, you know, there's there's the extreme end of that spectrum where people are doing 3D painted stuff to really throw people into sort of a you know panic that they're running into something. That would be silly, obviously. But but I mean, there's a lot of options out there, and this seems to be very conventional. So I don't know um, if there's if there's some opportunity to do something a little different. Um, that uh, might both can I touch on that? Little... Yeah. Could I respond to that real quick sure, and just sure. give you a little bit of history? So we've been working with staff for, for several months. I mean, you can even go back years if you wanted to, but um, heavily focused on this within the past 12 months. And when we first met with staff um, in, a, in, in a combination with Studio 39 and Vika, we had several conceptual ideas for not only the patterns within the crosswalk, but also in the middle of the intersections, we had um, kind of branding ideas, putting the crown logo intertwined in the in the crosswalks, and then doing something, you know, really extensive, kind of in that middle of the intersection where Brown right. Park and Ellington intersect. And we, we we tossed around a few ideas, and it it ultimately came back to, um, I mean, as everyone knows, there have been some incidents out there um, recently with pedestrians and vehicles, and it, it came down to a safety issue and Public Works. Um, actually directed us to kind of step off of that idea because they didn't want it to essentially become a distraction, right? If you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you start looking at all the pictures, you know, in the intersection and the crosswalks, you need to keep your eye on the road and vice versa. You know, if you're a pedestrian trying to cross the street, you know, they don't want you looking down, kind of reading what everything says. They want you to, to get across the street safely. So right. um, a combination of that and the you know, so we, so we scaled back a little bit based on what we were proposing, and then they directed us to go with a more traditional look, okay. um, just for that reason. That's fair. That's fair. Okay. Any other questions or comments? No? All right. Um, so, Caroline, you want to do the, we, and we have nobody signed up for public testimony, so Caroline, I guess we're, we're ready for the recommendation. So um, in the staff report, there are um, four suggested um, conditions, and I believe you would like to add a, a potential fifth regarding the, uh, reviewing a photometric right. plan uh, to ensure that the lighting is adequate. Um, but as with the, the last um, application, we are also, uh, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission hold the record open on AFP 8410-2020 until 5 p.m. on Thursday, July 9th, 2020, and defer final action until Wednesday, July 15th, 2020. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I got go ahead, ahead of myself. I got ahead of myself. You, you're asking first. Go ahead. Go ahead, Danny. If you have a comment or something. Or are you, are no, you no, no, no. I got ahead of you. Just do your thing. Um, I just want to get get one more um, kind of response from the commission on um, the basics, the, just the size of the crosswalks, the width. Is there any sense that, you know, it, it's to a certain extent, it's a graphic exercise, right? You're looking, you're on the street driving toward it, and how bold and how dramatic the white borders are help to stop the cars and you know kind of warn them they need to stop before the the crosswalk, or how wide they are just sort of changes the the nature of the intersection too. Are you all? comfortable with the basic proportions and size of, of those elements? So, John, uh, I'm gonna, I've been trying to figure out how to condense my diatribe into something, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, consumable, but I think, um, I think you're right. I think it, they're undersized for the sidewalk, and I think the instincts are to line it up with the new uh, Iron Spot uh, soldier courses, but I'm not sure that's the right direction. I think from a purely planning standpoint, a safety planning standpoint, they ought to move towards the intersection itself. So, uh, you know, yes, I would agree with you. I'd like to see, you know, 12 to 14 to 16 foot sidewalks that would move from their current location at the, in, at the outside of the intersection towards the, inter towards the inside of that intersection to be something where uh, two couples uh, walking in opposite directions can pass each other without, um, without uh, having to move out of that, out of that protected zone. Yep, yep. It moves toward closer towards what would be a table intersection, right? Uh, where where the four uh, it wouldn't they wouldn't quite connect, but uh, they probably ought to. But uh, where the four sidewalks would actually connect outside of the radius of the curb. Right. So what the inside the inside boundaries would move in the outside boundaries. Would stay That's right. About where they are. Even though there's a, there's an aesthetic you know inclination to make it line up with the soldier course, but I think that's much less important. Right. Uh, right. You know, let, let the cars have their view around the corner and, and protect the pedestrian towards the inside of the intersection. I think it's a much 
sort of much more traditional safety oriented thing. Right. And I have to say, you know, Greg, you, you might get a phone call from me or something tomorrow. I, I'm disappointed that we haven't been able to figure out a way to sort of not do, you know, heated pressed asphalt and we could do a, a great, you know, Studio 39, I'm sure, I'm, you know, I haven't seen it. I'm sure they came up with something interesting and I'm sure there's a way to make it safer in order to sort of differentiate what's a walk path and what's an intersection, um, you know, from a super graphic standpoint. So I, I'm not sure what it was that, uh, that um, you know, planning staff sort of capitulated to, you know, uh, you know, public works on, but uh, you know, this does, you know, and, and again, uh, to be clear, you know, there's three intersections we're talking about tonight. The other two intersections are important but they are you know, exponentially less important than this intersection. This is our high traffic intersection. This is where the vast majority of folks are crossing the street. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's also, you know, in a lot of ways, our, it's Maine and Maine, right? It's, it's Crown and Ellington. So it's, uh, it wants to be something different and something exciting. Uh, and attached to that is the idea that these pressed brick, pressed asphalt things, is, is, as easy as they are to refresh compared to a normal brick piece, they are also uh, exponentially more easy to ignore. So when they when they start going bad, uh, it's very easy for all of us, uh, uh, particularly in HOA, uh, to ignore their repair and and push it off uh, multiple years down the road. As opposed to a brick, you know, that's actually people are bumping over top of, and they're you know, it's a noticeable uh, need for improvement rather than a, just a worn, sad looking pressed asphalt piece you know this is essentially a big piece of plastic that's melted into the asphalt right yep. uh and uh and and i and i agree with you it's it's a it's a it's a very usable piece and if you come back every four years and repress it remelt it and resurface it it's a it can look really nice and it's a great alternative uh and uh you know snow plows love it uh cars love it uh but you but it's also much easier to ignore for eight years ten years and let it sort of waste away. And then all the properties and businesses around it suffer because of that. And yeah. so, you know, the, so it, as a combination of all that, you know, uh, and, 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 this, and this sort of newfound uh, place we're in where it's gonna come back to us again, uh, I think, right? Uh, is, uh, is, you know, I'd love for, for you know, uh, Caroline and, um, and, uh, and Greg to relook at a graphic uh, as opposed to a fake brick, and I, I know I'm asking you to back up and restart, but it seems like an opportunity where we could do something that is safe and clearly identified as this is the walk path and this is the drive aisle, uh, but but still give something that's more exciting at, at this intersection only, right? This is our this is our main and main. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think uh, I think the condition really is really look at both the size and the and the, the patterning. Yeah, I I think the size is is a key thing, especially in the new uh socially distant <laughs> distant world we're in if you put six between two couples on an eight foot sidewalk you've got people walking in the street right um, okay say nothing about all of the valid proportional points that matt matt raised mm. good all right uh, any other comments anyone no all right, so Caroline, I think what we're looking at is um, we, we will do the, I think you're recommending we defer, but um, we would want to get a condition in there to look at the, um, the size and the material again, and as well as bring back the photometrics for our review, right? Well, if they bring it back, we wouldn't, and it's, a, and it's acceptable to the planning commission, then it wouldn't, know, wouldn't need to be a condition when you all oh, right, you know, right. look okay. at it again. So we defer we, can, we just defer bring, we can just bring a revision back. Right, so we defer with comment. Um, so I guess I'd, I'd look at the applicants team. Are those two or three points something you guys could address over the course of the next week before uh, before it does come back? I don't know who can speak for them. Um, yeah, yes, I, I mean, I think so. First of all, thank you for the feedback. I mean, this is, this is super constructive and, you know, appreciate getting everyone's insight. Um, I can't speak to, to Mike and Siobhan's uh, workload, but I, you know, the fact that we have some of these conceptual designs already created uh, that Matt, you were referring to, I, I think it's, um, you know, those are obviously easy to produce and, 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 and float to staff and, and ultimately get to you guys. And then, you know, the photometrics and the, and the crosswalk uh, dimensions and, and, and those, those concerns, I think can definitely be addressed, you know, within the next week or so for sure. Yeah. Great. All right, any other comments? 
I, I should have said, John, too, that the, the additional vertical elements, the full threshold and uh, addition of benches and then the, the soldier course outline of the handicap ramps, I think yeah. is, is a great improvement. Yeah. And, uh, and, it, and it's actually been noticed by me as I stumble out of some of these restaurants that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that uh, it's a need. Uh, and especially, I really love coming from the residential bulk now that it's, it's building every day. We just saw the applicant before you is building more homes. As those folks come up that sidewalk, it, having them actually walk through a, a true threshold is, I think, a, a brilliant branding idea and a, a welcome addition. So thank you. Agreed. Thanks for pointing that out because you're, you're absolutely right. Okay. Um, so staff has recommended the d deferral of this until our, um, or have the record open on this until 5 p.m. on Thursday, July 9th and defer final action until Wednesday, July 15th. Is there a motion, please? So moved. Now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is there a second for the record? Second. Okay. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, Commissioner Wessel. Aye. Commissioner Hopkins. Aye. Commissioner Kaufman. Aye. Commissioner Winborn. Aye. And I will vote aye as well. Thank you all very much. I appreciate you uh, getting getting after this one, finally. It's been a while, a long time in coming. So thank you. And thank look you. forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. You as well. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Um, that takes us to, um, from the commission. Um, Lloyd, anything tonight? Nothing for me. Uh, Phil? Yep, nothing for me. Danny? Um, no, just have a, a safe and socially distant uh, fourth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, and Matt, anything tonight? Nothing for me. Okay, great. Um, and then from the staff, um, Greg, John, who wants to jump in? I just have two dates to remind uh, the commission. Our next planning commission is July 15th, and there's a joint work session um, for, the four, for the 700 North Frederick Avenue uh, sketch plan that's scheduled for July 27th. Right, and then we're going to have that extra meeting in August to help with that process, right? That's all that's correct. up now? Okay. That's correct. All right, great. Um, thanks, Greg. John, how you doing? Sure, good. Uh, good, good evening, Commission. Um, just a few things tonight. Uh, I just want to let you know that City Hall is going to be open to the public starting on Monday, uh, July 6th. Uh, we are still encouraging teleworking, and I, I think our uh, planning staff in particular has been ex especially successful in, in teleworking. Uh, but planning staff will be coming in um, alternate days. We're trying to keep the population as low as possible at City Hall for the foreseeable future. Um, but the public will be um, coming in and uh, planner of the day will be going on. We're, we're still encouraging appointments, but um, uh, we will be available if the public does come in. Um, uh, also, with regard to the July 27th work session, uh, Rob Robinson and I met with uh, the applicant team of 700 North Frederick yesterday, and um, we're helping them to prepare for that work session. Uh, we haven't had a work session like this in a while, so this will be a interesting evening, I'm sure. And I did uh, want to let you know that we continue to get Friday updates from WRS, the owner of the core of Lake Forest Mall. Um, the mall did reopen last Monday. Uh, Macy's has reopened as well. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly how many of the tenants are open at this point, but, um, um, but uh, they are starting to um, uh, you know, become more operational. And um, the latest news from um, WRS was that they do have a lender that they're working with that is capable of financing the purchase of all the anchors. Um, but they're uh, still working through their due date. And that's all I have for tonight, unless you have questions. Great. Thanks, John. Anything else from anybody? Okay. If not, well, thank you all very much. Um, have a good evening, and then we're adjourned.